second class on the full armor of God. And I'm so glad to see you here again. Before we get going, let's open in prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity again to share your words. Please guide my mind, keep me on focus, and help us to fully understand all of the armor of God and all of the ways we use it, Lord. And help us in our healthy habits to develop our, our mature spiritual walk with you to fight off all the strategies of the devil. Bless those that came with us here in person and those that are going to see it online. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Okay, so today we're going to continue with our full armor of God. And we're going to first go over a little bit of what we learned last class. Last class we learned how to recognize a false prophet and that we do this by studying God's word and by praying every day so that we know what that Bible says so we'll be able to identify when we're being told lies. And we learned about the belt of truth and that Jesus is the truth and we need to make sure that we know we know his, his truth. And we learned about the breastplate of righteousness and how important it is for, it is for us to remember that we're righteous in God's, in God's eyes because we trust in Jesus and we're following him. And we learned about the shoes of peace and how important it is that we show God's peace to everywhere we go and share what he's done for us by bringing them the good news that they can have the same peace we do. Now in this class, we're gonna talk about the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit, which is God's word. The shield of faith, well, Believers are instructed in, in Ephesians chapter 6 to take the shield of faith above everything else because faith involves acknowledging of truth, acknowledgement of our sins, and accepting God's way to make peace. And the shield of faith must be taken above all. And faith implies believing in something else, doesn't it, or someone else. Well, biblical faith is trust in or believing in Jesus Christ. And to be fully covered, we must trust in Jesus. We can't think that we know the answers or anybody else. It's got to be Jesus. Have faith in his words. Now, have you ever felt weighed down by the stresses in your life? You know, when you're younger, everyday stresses start weighing you down even way back then, even more so when we get older, but some of the ones that weigh people down are things like a new marriage. When someone gets married and they're learning to live with someone different and they're learning each other's habits and stuff, it can be stressful. And then a lot of times right away they add a new home with a new payment and then they have the stress of, are we gonna be able to make this mortgage or what if something breaks, we can't call the landlord, we have to fix it, you know, hoping that they, don't fall behind on things. That adds a lot of stress to your family. And then if you start having children, the larger your family grows, the larger your stresses can grow along with it. You know, or are you gonna be able to feed them okay? What if they get sick? Which one's gonna take off work to take care of them? How do you teach them the right ways of God? There's a lot of stress on a family. And there are so many other things in life too that can cause us stress and weigh us down and we start feeling heavy under all these pressures. You really have to have faith in these times because it's faith. It's the faith in God's word and what he promises that's gonna bring you up out of, the, out of those stressful times so you don't get lost in them. Look in Psalms 116 verse six, it says, the Lord preserves the simple. I was brought low and he helped me. Now faith can lift you, lift you up up out of those stressful times, so we need to make sure we remember it. Let's look at a little uh, a story in Luke. I like this story. You know, Jesus was this in this story. Jesus was surrounded by a lot of of people. He was talking. He was 
speaking his words to them and healing them. And there were two men that had a paralyzed friend. And they brought him in on his bed, but they couldn't get through the crowd to get to Jesus. Because they knew if they could just get him to Jesus, Jesus would heal him, but they couldn't get in there. So finally, they took him up on the rooftop and lowered him down so he could be in front of Jesus. Look with me in Luke chapter 5, verse 19. It says, And when they could not find by what way they might bring him because of the multitude, they went upon the housetop and let him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus. They did that because they just knew that if they could get him there, he'd be healed. Do you have that kind of faith that if you just bring your problems to Jesus, he can fix it? You know, there are a lot of arrows that are going to be flying around at us. Let me ask you, are any of these arrows coming at you or your family? You might not even recognize these as arrows from the devil, but they are. There's things like lust, gluttony, greed, sloth, wrath, envy, pride, and even denial. All of those are devil's arrows. Now the full armor of God will protect you against all of these arrows and even more. But we need to pick up that shield of faith, right, and get ready to fight because we're in a spiritual battle. You know, when, I, when we lived in Hawaii, one of the pastors there used to say, we are not on a cruise ship. We're on a battleship. Be ready to fight. Now let's look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16. It says, in addition to all of these, hold up your shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. And again, it doesn't say that faith might stop them. It says to stop them. You have to have faith and don't doubt. Let's talk about the first arrow of lust. In 2 Timothy 2.22, it says, Run from anything that stimulates youthful lust. Instead, pursue righteous living, faithfulness, love, and peace. Enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. And that tells us that we need to really watch the kind of company we keep, right? And then if we look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 29, it tells us, And if your right eye offends you, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it profits, for it is profitable for you that one of your members should perish and not that your whole body be cast into hell. I know that sounds harsh, but that's so true. You know, we need to be willing to give up whatever it takes to follow Christ because our very souls depend on it. And in James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, it says, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away by his own lust and enticed. Then, when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin. And when sin is finished, it brings forth death. You might be wondering, well, how do you stop lust? Well, you know, chastity or self-control cures lust by controlling the, um, that passion and leveraging it, all of that energy, for the good of others. Let's look at the second arrow, gluttony. You know, in the dictionary, there's a couple of different de definitions for gluttony. The first one is a person who eats and drinks excessively or vulgariously. And the second one is a person with a remarkably great desire or capacity for some things. First example is a glutton for work. The second one is a glutton for punishment. And there are more. You can be a glutton for a lot of things that are not food. People always assume that that's all the type of glutton there is, but there's not. Anything that you just, you know, money, fame, work, things like that. In Ephesians chapter 3, verses 18 and 19, it says, For many walk, of whom I've told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, 
and whose glory is in your shame, who mind earthly things. So don't be a glutton for anything in this earth. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 2, it says, And on the, on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all of the work which he had made. Even God stopped to rest. So as it says in Proverbs 22, verse 3, a prudent person, oh, I skipped one. I apologize. Exodus 20, verse 9 says, Six days shall thou labor and do all your work. And then Genesis 2, 2 was, and on the seventh day God ended the work and rested. So you, again, he tells you, you have six days to do your work. And then in Proverbs 22, verse 3, it says, A prudent person foresees danger and takes precautions. A simpleton goes blindly on and suffers the consequences. So when you are working like a workaholic, and you get tired, and you're not resting, you just keep going, you keep going, you're going to suffer the consequences because you're going blindly on and not doing what the Bible says. You're not taking a day of rest with the Lord. You might be wondering, well, what can we cure gluttony? I've got things to do. I've got bills to pay. I've got people to do. Whatever it is, temperance can cure gluttony by, by giving you a desire to be healthy and, and being a desire to, giving you a desire to be healthy so that you can make yourself fit to serve others, fit to work for God. That's your goal. Remember, we're here to please Him, not ourselves. You know, the next arrow is greed that we're going to look at. And I just love this old story about an old Cherokee chief. He was teaching his grandson all about life. It says, a fight is going on inside of me, he told, told the boy. It's a terrible fight, and it's between two wolves. The one is evil. He's angry. He's angry. Envy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, gluttony, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority, self-doubt, and ego. The other is good. He is joy, peace, love, hope, serenity humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. That same fight is going on inside you and every other person too. The grandson then asked his grandfather which one will win. The old sheep simply replied, the one you feed. So we need to all be careful what we're feeding. Make sure we don't feed into the greed. You know, the dictionary defines greed as an excessive or rapturous desire, especially for wealth or possessions. Greed, greediness, denote an excessive, extreme desire for something, often more than one's proper share. You might be wondering, well, what can cure greed? Well, charity cures greed because you're putting your desires to help others above storing up treasures for your own self. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 10 says, He who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver, nor he who loves abundance with increase. This is also vanity. Let's look at the sloth. Now the sloth is identified on the web as habitual disinclination to exertion, indolence, laziness. Do you know any sloths? Well, let's look at what the Bible says about a sloth. In Proverbs chapter 6, verse 6, Solomon spoke of the sloth, saying, Go to the ant, you sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. 
Have you ever watched an ant farm? How those ants just never stop. They're always working and being wise with their time. They're not lazy. Well, you might wonder what, what cures slothfulness. Well, diligence or zeal is what cures slothfulness because that places your interest in other people again above a life of ease and relaxation. You have to be thinking about others like we're told to do. Now the fifth arrow is wrath. Wrath is an uncontrollable anger and hate toward another person. Here are some more that we're, we're going to be reading some more scriptures here about this. Let's look at Romans 12, 19. It says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Now what cures wrath, you might be wondering? Well, patience cures wrath. By first, you have to understand the needs and desires of the other person before you react or start speaking. You have to be patient and think about where it's coming from. Now the next arrow we're going to look at is the arrow of envy. Envy is the intense desire to have an item or an experience that someone else has. The Bible tells us this about envy. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 14, verse 30. A sound heart is life to the body, but envy, the rottenness of the bones. So make sure you're, you're not being envious because it tells us that that's going to that's be rottenness to us. We need to stay away from it. So what cures envy? Kindness cures envy. It's by placing the desire to help other people above our, our need to, that we feel to supersede them. We need to put their desire ahead of ours. We don't have to be right. Only God has to be right. Arrow, number seven, is pride. Now pride is an excessive view of one's, excessive view of oneself without regard to what other people think. In Proverbs 8, 13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride, arrogance, and the evil way, and the forward mouth do I hate. So we need to keep all of these in check. We don't want the Lord to hate what we're doing. So what cures, what cures pride? Well, humility cures pride by removing one's ego and boastfulness and allows us to have an attitude of serving. Remember, even Jesus came, didn't come to be served. He came to serve, and we're supposed to be following like Jesus. Now, the last arrow is denial. This is often how the unbelievers are to us when we share the Bible with them, and we share the truths of the Bible with them. They want to deny it. The definition of denial in the dictionary is an assertion. Well, there's a few definitions we'll go over. The first one is an assertion that something said, believed, or alleged, etc., is false. This, and it gives two examples. The, despite his denials, we knew that he had taken that purse. And the next one is the politician issued a denial of his opponent's charges. So even when things are true, they deny it. The next definition is refusal to believe a doctrine, a theory, or the like. How many people have you talked to that refuse to believe the doctrine of the Bible, the theory of the Bible? And the third definition is disbelief of an existing existence or reality of a thing. The atheists don't even believe in God. They're, de they're denying that he even exists. So what cures denial? Well, understanding God's truth. The more you read, the more the Holy Spirit will open up these truths to you. And the more you understand them, the more it cures the denial. Now next, we're going to take a look at the helmet of salvation. 
We all know that we need the helmet um, to be saved, but let's look at why and for what. Now the helmet of salvation protects more than just our head from injuries or our brain or our mind from, you know, the arrows out there, but it protects our soul from eternal punishment. It tells us in 1 Thessalonians that the helmet is our hope of salvation. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8 says, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an, a helmet, the hope of salvation. Now the purpose of the helmet of salvation, the purpose of the helmet of salvation is our salvation is what saves us from the fiery pit of hell. And it gives us eternal life with Jesus Christ. We don't want eternal death. We want eternal life. And it's, it's our salvation that gives us that. You know, Christian religion has declined so much in the U.S. I've got some charts that I put up here. And if we look at the chart, we're going to see that from 2008 until 2015, that Christian religion, or Christians that say that they're religious, right, declined from 80.1% all the way down to 75.2%. Well, now it's changed from 2015 till now, according to the PEW Research Center, Back in December of 2021, it says self-identified Christians make up only 63% of the U.S. population in 2021. You know, that's down from 75% only a decade ago. The non-Christian religion, on this next slide, has stayed about the same. You know, even to today, it, it's about the same 5-ish percent. And it's the non-religious group. It went from 14.6% that said they were not religious at all, at all in 2008. It went all the way up to 19.6 in 2015. Do you have any idea where it is today? Today, it's three out of every 10 US adults are now religiously unaffiliated. You know what that means. Almost a third of our population doesn't have the truth of Jesus, doesn't know about God, doesn't have a hope for their future. Remember, we're called to go share the truth with them. It's our duty, it's our responsibility. That's what we're called to do. We have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of people to share the gospel with. Now, there are a lot of different ideas there are so many different ideas in the world today that it's so easy to get off track. And again, the false prophets and things. This is why it's so important we know God's word. We have to keep on studying the truth of the Bible every day because remember the devil's number one goal is to steal, kill, and destroy our memories, our hopes, our dreams. So we need to make sure we keep armored and keep studied and keep prayed up daily. We need to be ready to share these words when we see others in need. And we do that by knowing what the Bible says. And then when we see something or someone said to us, we can quote scripture back or at least draw from it when we answer them. Now, we need to share the truth. It's up to us to share the truth with them. We're called to be witnesses for Jesus. If we don't tell them, how will they know? In John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Then if we look in Romans chapter 10, verses 14 through 15, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And... How can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? How can they hear about him unless someone tells them? 
And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That's why, this is why the scriptures say how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring good news. Now in Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, and again in Romans 1, verse 16, it tells us, um, first let's, I'm going to start with Matthew 10, 32. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. So we need to make sure we're not ashamed of Jesus, not ashamed of our walk with him, and we're proud of what he's done for us and share it. In Romans 1, 16, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God into salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and then to the Greek, which is the Gentile, that's us. You know, Jesus came to love the world not to judge us, but to love us, to teach us to love him and to love each other. We are to be like Jesus and to love others enough to share with them a new hope, to share with them a salvation that can save them from eternal damnation. We need to make sure we're looking at the world through the eyes of Jesus and love them enough. In Second Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, it says, For he says, In the time of my favor I heard you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Remember, salvation is a gift from God. We need to make sure we share this gift. There's nothing or no one else that can save us in our life. Salvation is only from God. It says in Revelation chapter 7, verse 10, Salvation belongs to our God which sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And we know that to be Jesus. Now let's look at the sword of the Spirit. This is God's word. The sword of the spirit is the only part of God's armor that is the offensive weapon for us. It's to combat Satan and his, and his demons with. Remember how Jesus was tempted by the devil in Matthew chapter 4? And he combated every one of the devil's temptings. You know, cast yourself off this mountain, he'll save you. Or turn the stones into bread, you're hungry. You know, the word of God is what he gave back to Satan. So we are trained to be like Christ. We need to do the same thing. When these fiery arrows of the devil are coming at us, we need to quote scripture back to him, just like Jesus did. That's our offensive tool. Everything else, we're kind of in a defensive mode, you know. We pray, we're having faith, we're studying, but this is our weapon, the word of God. The Word of God is our Bible, and the more we read it, and the more we memorize it, the sharper our weapon's going to be, and the more it will come, the more quickly it will come to our mind when we need it. The sword is your Bible in Ephesians six, chapter seventeen. Yeah, Ephesians six, seventeen. Back up one slide, please. Perfect. Thank you. So we need to make sure in Ephesians 6, chapter 17, it says, and take the helmet of salvation, which is the sword of the Spirit. Oh, and the sword of the Spirit, which is God's word. So make sure you have your sword. That's what you fight with. We don't fight with our words. We don't fight with our anger. We fight with the word of God. It's so very important part of your armor. So make sure you have it in daily practice. Put your reading in and your prayer in. Remember, we're in a war. We 
you are in a spiritual battle, make sure you're ready. Thank you. Now, remember the sword of the Bible. Now let's look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, Pierces, piercing even to the dividing center of the soul and the spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of all the thoughts and intents of the heart. And another good scripture is John 6, 63. The spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words that I have spoken to you, they are full of the spirit of life. It's pretty, pretty blunt there. Our flesh counts for nothing, but it's the words of God the full, that gives us full spirit of life. Now, put on all God's armor so that we'll be able to re we'll be ready to stand firm against all of the strategies of, of the devil. We've been over all six pieces now, so in 1 John 5, 4 through 5, it says, For every child of God defeats the evil world and will achieve this victory through our faith. And who can win the battle against the world? Only those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, we put on the board here some scriptures again for each of the six parts of the armor of God. I hope you can see them. I'll try to tell you what they are. If I can see them. Okay, the helmet of salvation was Ephesians 6, verse 17, Isaiah 59, verse 17, and 1 Thessalonians 5 and 8. The breastplate of righteousness was Ephesians 6, 14, Isaiah 59, 17, Philippians 3, 9, and 1 Thessalonians. I can't see the scripture. Okay. The shield of faith was Ephesians 6, 16, 1 John 5, 4. The belt of truth was Ephesians 6, 14, and John 14, 6. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, Ephesians 6, 17, Hebrews 4, 12, and John 6, 63. But Ephesians 6, 11 through 12 says, put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. I hope this has been a blessing to you. I hope you've gotten something out of these classes. We'll go over what we learned the last couple of classes. It's been how to recognize a false prophet. We do this by studying God's word and prayer every day. We learned about the belt of truth, that Jesus is our truth, we learned about the breastplate of righteousness and to be righteous, how important it is for us to be righteous in God's eyes. And we learned about the shoes of peace, how we need to show God's peace that lives in us all around us and be ready to share the good news. We talked about the shield of faith and that biblical faith is trust in or believing in Jesus Christ. We talked about the helmet of salvation and how it it's salvation that protects our soul, our very soul from eternal punishment. And we talked about the wonderful sword of the spirit and how it's God's word. It's our Bible. It's our, it's our weapon. And again, I hope you've learned something about this. Please feel free to share with me if you have any questions. If you're watching online, feel free to leave a comment, ask a question, and make sure you give us a like and encourage us to keep on sharing classes with you. And if you haven't already done so, Subscribe so that you'll be notified when we post a new class. Join me next time where I have a question. I'm good at those. I always have questions. Next time we're going to be talking about our attitudes. The question will be, did you know that your attitude is contagious? Is yours worth catching? We'll find help with our attitudes in God's word. 
and we'll be going over the 20 keys of having a positive attitude. I hope you'll come and join me and bring a friend. I look forward to seeing you next time. Let's close in prayer before we leave. Thank you so much, dear Heavenly Father, for this wonderful opportunity to be with my fellow brothers and sisters sharing your word. Please help each one of us as we go on our way home, keep us safe, and bring us back safely next time. And help us to stay fully armored up with everything we've learned today, and to keep all the healthy habits that we're learning, to pray and study our Bible every day. Help us to remember these and commit to be faithful in our spiritual maturity to you, Lord. I ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.